During his presidential campaign in 2016, President Trump often spoke about changing trade policies, including revamping the North American Free Trade Agreement and imposing tariffs on imports. He argued these changes would protect American jobs and the economy. That populist message struck a chord with many voters. But why? Our economics correspondent Paul Salman has a look at how growing public discontent has turned into a major political force. It's part of his weekly series, Making Sense. We have rebuilt China. They have taken so much money out of our country. If President Trump has had one consistent message since the beginning of his campaign, it's been that America is getting a raw deal in the global economy. Our factories were shuttered, our steel mills closed down, and our jobs were stolen away and shipped far away to other countries, some of which you've never even heard of. Now, manufacturing jobs are ticking up. The president has opposed a host of tariffs, that is, taxes, on imports, and threatened more, and reworking NAFTA. The agreement that regulates trade with Canada and Mexico is also on his economic agenda. We're going to get it opened up. Oh, we're not doing business with these other countries, right? It's playing well with the president's base, as evidenced by a recent rally in Michigan. He's brought the awareness to getting that trade back from China. And then we're going to be seeing undeniable results. The policy changes and the people who support them are all part of an ideology known as populism. Populism is generally a sense that the elite are corrupt and that there is a group which stands for the will of the people. Former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund and later head of India's central bank, Raghuram Rajan, thinks the recent populist wave has an economic basis, which he says... It reflects to some extent a frustration with the pace of economic growth. So slower growth than America had been used to. Second, the economic gains, however modest, have not been felt evenly across the country. The Midwestern towns that are hurting, really, those aren't necessarily benefiting from this growth. And those swing state towns, long dependent on factories that have offshored and left them hanging, swung the election to Trump. Were the free trade policies of previous administrations to blame, as Trump supporters believe? Economist Teresa Gillarducci says no. I don't think it was the, the fault of good-intentioned, good-hearted progressives. Consider how the big auto bailouts undertaken during the Bush and Obama administrations by their economic brain trusts helped the Midwest. Those regions would have fallen way, you know, much further behind than they did. But, Paul, they still fell behind. And that falling behind exacerbated populist resentment, says economist Deirdre McCloskey, against those of us who complacently benefited from the post-industrial economy. I guess we caused it because we didn't keep up enough populist banter. You mean we didn't, we didn't... Say enough populist things. And the message constantly portrayed in the media that economic inequality was growing made matters worse or so McCloskey controversially claims. It's that the politicians and some academics indeed and some, a lot of journalists have emphasized it, have said, oh, you're, you poor people, your inequality has increased, which is dubiously true. And so what you're saying is that when people like myself say, look at the growing yeah. inequality, yeah. The people who might otherwise have said, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay, not to worry. I, suddenly I, are now alerted to their lower status. Is exactly. that Exactly. And the resulting anxiety helped fuel the populist fire. Well, maybe. But even if not, a recent University of Pennsylvania study concluded that, quote, change in financial well-being had little impact on candidate preference, unquote. And that instead... Trump voters were moved by a loss in status for two main reasons. The first is globalization, that Americans feel they're falling behind as other people, mainly the Chinese, surge ahead. And that has led many Americans to despair, as highlighted by the opioid crisis in so many of the pockets of populism. Or so argues University of Michigan economist Lisa Cook. 
I've lived in Europe and I've lived in Russia, and I think that I've seen the worst of what populism can bring. Including, says Cook, the heavy drinking that followed the collapse and loss of international status in the former Soviet Union. All of a sudden, Russia was exposed to these global forces. What happened? Life expectancy for men fell to rates that we saw in developing countries. You can say that the opioid crisis is the same kind of crisis, sort of placating the nervousness, the anxiety that people have. So opioids are the vodka of America? Yes. A second cause of status anxiety, according to the University of Pennsylvania study, growing racial diversity, which supposedly undermines white Americans' sense of primacy. That finding comes as little surprise to African-American economist Derek Hamilton, who thinks it explains much of President Trump's success. If we're just going to be blunt, he was signaling to white Americans that your relative position will be restored with my, with my presidency. Going out and voting, it's your last chance. It's your last chance to make our country truly, truly, truly great again. So I'm, I'm coming in, and I'm your last chance with this impending demographic change of all these non-whites that are going to uh, change the relative proportion of America. The message that voters had more to gain than lose resonated, says Teresa Gilarducci. And if a powerful white man says, I am on your side, why not take a chance? Whatever the explanation, President Donald Trump, trying to restore America's place in the world economy, has now targeted Chinese trade practices. China has promised to retaliate, and fears of an escalating trade war fill the air. Stoked by President Trump's recent tweet that, quote, when you're already $500 billion down, you can't lose. Of course, many economists say there's plenty to lose. But the president's popular supporters feel they've lost enough already to take the chance. This is economics correspondent Paul Salmon reporting for the PBS NewsHour.